بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين Praise be to Allah, glory be to Allah, thanks belong to Allah, He deserves all this always, because He's our Lord, who is our cherisher, who is our sustainer, we believe He's the only one who deserves worship, and He's the only one we shall ever worship, we will not worship any other thing besides Him, and we believe that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that He sends to us as a guide, is the final messenger, and the bright life's prophet of Allah, after whom there will be no new prophet. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his family and the companions. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to bless all of you. May Allah bless us. May Allah bless our families. May Allah grant us beneficial knowledge. May Allah make Quran our intercessor on the day of resurrection. May Allah be with us all. We are still in Surah to Yunus, Quran chapter 10 of the Quran, we <coughs> stopped at uh, verse 30. Today, inshallah, we are going to start from verse 31. There, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Don't forget, anytime you, want, anytime you want to recite the Quran, Allah has instructed us, Faidha, Qur'atta al-Quran, Fasta'idh Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Whenever you want to read the Quran, say, A'uzu billahi min shaitan rajim Seek refuge with Allah against shaitan, the accost. A'uzu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qul man yarzukukum min as-sama'i wal-awd. أَمَّنْ يَمْلِكُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارِ وَمَنْ يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيْتِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيْتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيْتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ وَمَنْ يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرُ فَسَيَقُولُونَ اللَّهِ فَقُلْ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Allah says, say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man yarzikukum min as-samahi wal awd. Who is it that provides for you from the heavens, or from the heaven, from the sky, and the hearts? Who provides for you from the sky and hearts? Amman yamliku as-samah wal abasar. Who owns hearing and sight? Who has full control over hearing and sight. وَمَنْ يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ Who brings out the living from the dead? وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ And brings out the dead from the living. وَمَنْ يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرُ Who disposes the affairs of the universe? وَسَيَقُولُونَ اللَّهِ Definitely, they will say, it is Allah. Fakul, then say, Afala tattakun, will you not then be afraid of Allah? Why would you not be afraid of Allah if you know that He is the one who does this? This verse is one of the proofs of Rububiyya of Allah. Rububiyya means to believe in the unity of Allah and His Lordship over the world. He is the only creator of the world. And the only true Lord of the world he is the cherisher of the world, he is the nourisher of the world, he is the one who sustains the universe. When you believe this, then you must know that one, two things must follow. If you believe that Allah has these attributes, two things must follow, which is, Afala tattaqun, won't you fear Allah? Won't you be afraid of Him? Fear of Allah should follow, and also being conscious of Him is part of a taqwa 
to fear him. One of the reasons why one may grow in fatwa, in taqwa, in fear of Allah, is when we appreciate the greatness of Allah through his creation. Allah is wonderful. Allah is so mighty. Allah is so great. When you see to determine his greatness, look at great things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And uh, Allah has made it impossible for anyone to claim that he is the creator or the sustainer of the world. No one has ever claimed to be the creator of the universe and sustainer of the universe except Allah. We may all do in our own fully attributes to some things, some things we may attribute some attributes of divinity to them in our own fully, in foolishness sometimes, even though we know that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the creator of everything. Now let's analyze the verse again. Look at the question that Allah has asked. Allah has asked here. See, man yarusukukum mila samai wal aw. Who provides for you from the sky and the earth? Which means that provisions for creatures come from the sky and some come from the earth. We know that there are many things that Allah has put in place for us in the sky that we greatly benefit from today. The solar energy is there. The ability to make phone calls is there. And uh, there is, I mean, the technology we use in making calls is there. And the atmosphere itself is there. The air, the oxygen in the air, the carbon dioxide goes there that benefits other natures and I mean other creatures and many other things that Allah has created for us. We are able to study the celestial bodies and their movements and their relationship. That is where we are able to fly our planes. We are able to set our drones and we are able to do many things through the knowledge of our cosmology and uh, through the knowledge of the, uh, the celestial bodies. Our risk, our profession actually comes from there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has set this in place. Why would anyone deny him? Not one would deny Allah except someone who is uh, very ignorant. Everything points to the fact that there must be a maker for this made object because everything is made. And every made object is a sign and a proof for the existence of the maker. Our risk also comes from health. We know from the heart. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created so many mineral resources for us and natural resources that we extract from the heart that supports us. We all see <coughs> how we are able to move our automobiles, our vehicles, our cars. We are able to use them because of the fuel that Allah has created for us. From what comes from the ground, we can bring out many things, kerosene, gas, and many others. Just imagine a world whereby there is no, nothing like this fuel. Imagine a world where there is no gas. Imagine a world where there is no diesel. Imagine a world where there is no petrol. Imagine a world where we don't have all this air. How will you be able to use our uh, locomotive for uh, our engines and our automobiles and how will we be able to fly our planes and many other things we use this energy source of energy for and apart from that every day we must eat we eat every day everyone listening to me including myself we have taken something today even if you are fasting you did take your sahur you took something most of what we eat come comes from the heart and uh, if it's the animal you may see what the animals do depend on comes from the, from the heart. Apart from this, what we are putting on, the clothes I'm wearing, the clothes you are wearing, much of the fabrics come from the, what the heart grows. The same thing if you are sitting on the, a piece of furniture in your house, you are sitting on a table inside your car, wherever you may be, what you are using presently actually has come from the heart, one way or the other. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared the heart for us. These are not new things, but we are just discovering them. Allah knows what we need, and He knows when we need what we need. And He has given us that intellect also to use, to explore, explore the heart and discover different things He has made for us as facilities of life. Who could have done this if not a wise Lord? If not for a wise Lord, the all-knowing Allah, 
He knows everything, everywhere, every time. This is where we have to declare his glory and we have to see every reason to humble ourselves before him in worship and in obedience to his word. His word. Allah says, Who provides for you from the heaven, from the sky, and uh, from the from the heart. The rain that falls too is another. Without the rain, just imagine a world without rain. You know how our life will become. If rain could stop, then the water cycle stops, then a lot of things are going to be affected. The world itself may go into extinction. Allah says, The second thing we need to ponder over is our hearing and our sight. Who has full control over, over them? We, miss, we are only using them, we actually don't have full control over them. Because even our lives, we don't have full control over all our lives. We go to bed, we don't know whether we will be awake the other day or not. It is Allah who gives us the ability, who enables us to come back to life after death. The same thing in our sight, our hearing. It is Allah who has granted us the ability to use them. Imagine, remember, when we were born, we had the facilities, the faculties to see, faculties to hear, but we couldn't use them until Allah enables us. And there are many people that Allah enabled to use this sight and to use their hearing, but after a while, Allah still disabled them, we uh, disabled them from using these uh, faculties and didn't do anything. Some have been blind and they are still blind till today. They have tried to do everything to gain their sight, so, but Allah has not restored their sight. It's in the hands of Allah. The same thing, the ability to hear. Some are dumb. If Allah wills, he could have given them the ability to hear. It is Allah who does that. You don't have full control over it. Assuming you can't see and you can't hear, what do you think the kind of life, miserable life, you, just imagine the kind of miserable life you have been living. A lot of this, you have been deprived of so many things. In fact, you may not be where you are now if you can't see or you can't hear. This is why, because of uh, the vitality and the importance of these things, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to ask Allah to enable him to be able to see and to hear until he lives the word. He used to say, O Allah, grant us well-being in our hearing and our sight. He used to make this dua. And also, every morning and evening, he used to say, Allahumma afini fi badani, Allahumma afini fi sam'i, Allahumma afini fi basari, la ilaha illa. And, O Allah, grant me well-being in my body. O Allah, grant me well-being in my hearing, my sight, for there is no other God besides you. That is Allah. Allah says, Who brings the living from the dead? And brings the dead from the living. All of us, we know our beginning. We know our genesis, how our life started. We used to be kind of a sexual discharge in the wombs of our mother that became something that became a living being. This thing was dead. Spam, Spamatuzu is dead. It's like he's dead. Allah's one who Allah gave it life and it became you and it became me. That is Allah's one who Allah. So when you see sperm on your body, when you have a sexual dream, for example, you see that it's a dead thing you are dealing with, not something that actually acts in life. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dead objects becoming something, becoming a living. You see our ends too. We have uh, chickens. Look at how chickens hatch their eggs. You see the eggs. The eggs are lifeless. We eat eggs. If they were living, we would not just be putting them into... They be uh, 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 roasting them like that and be eating them. So we use we eat egg it is lead, but if with incubation they can become something, then they hatch into living beings, into chicks. Subhanallah, that is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, as He brings the dead from the living, and also Arab and the other way around, Allah brings the living from the dead. It is someone who is dead in faith. Allah can bring a living person from it. A believer can come from a disbeliever. Many people have their parents as disbelievers and they are believers in Allah. And it happens that as well that believers may have children who may be disbelievers in Allah. Like Prophet Nu, one of his sons was a disbeliever in Allah. And look at this righteous man, the first messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to the world. So if Allah decides that something like this would happen, 
who who have resisted it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this. He brings out the dead from the living. Allah says who controls the affairs of the universe. There is no one who controls this. Allah has only enabled us to study the universe, but to control the physical existence, we can't do that. The physical existence, we can't do that. Nobody can uh, disrupt the movement and the motion of the sun or of the moon or the stars in the heaven. We can only study them and harness them or use them to benefit ourselves and in order to uh, journey to conduct our voyages and uh, other things we may want to use this knowledge for. But to control them, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who does that. We have all seen our world. Everything has been going according to the motion and according to the natural law that Allah has set for everything. If they change all what Allah has set for them, the whole world will be disrupted. Assuming the sun rises in the night or the noon rises and it meets the sun in the day, what do you think will happen? So what do you think will happen? That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have every reason to love our Lord Allah. We have every reason to declare his glory. We have every reason to live by him and live for him. Allah says, first of all, Allah, Allah, once you fear this Allah, if everybody knows that this is Allah, why would you not fear him? Now see the seriousness of those who are attributing divinity to other things besides Allah, like the Christians who call on Jesus, like the Christians who believe that Jesus is Lord, Allah of Lord. They believe that Jesus is God. They don't even know what they believe, whether Jesus is Son of God or God or whatever. They don't, many of them don't know. They are living in confusion. It's a serious, it's a serious ideological mistake these people are falling into. We need to really do da'wah in all <laughs> diplomatic and polite manners possible in order to bring them out of the darkness where they are in, they are in and bring them into the light of, uh, of Islam. We really need to do da'wah because if Allah described himself like this, and even the mushrikun, the pagans who lived during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they declared that it is Allah who created all this as Allah who does this, even though they used to worship idols, thinking that the idols will bring them closer to Allah. Even though these people, they were pagans, they did declare the divinity of Allah. They know that Allah is the Lord of the world. Yet, now look at those that we live with, who even do not recognize this Allah and think that Jesus is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to do da'wah. May Allah keep us firm on the path of guidance. Afala tatapun. Let's fear Allah. We have every reason to fear him. Verse 32. Allah says, فَذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقِّ فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ فَأَنَّا تُسْرَفُونَ فَذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ That is Allah. رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقِّ Your Lord in truth. That is Allah. Your Lord in truth. فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ Then what else can there be? Safe error. After the truth, what else can there be apart from error? This is the truth. Apart from the truth, nothing can there be but error. Allah says, فَأَنَّا تُسْرَفُونَ Why are you turned away from this? Worship Allah alone is the one who is in control of the universe. Do not attribute divinity to any other thing besides Allah. Put your trust on this great Allah. The one verse in the Quran, Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah likens those who call on other things besides him to those to the, uh, the spider who puts up a building. Allah says the weakest of all buildings is what is that of the, the spider. When you look at the cobweb, you see the technology know-how, technology know-how and, uh, uh, and the dexterity of uh, the spiders in the way they control, they construct their uh, their cobweb, subhanAllah. When you watch them do it, <coughs> or they have completed it, now watch it, you see <coughs> ikma, wisdom, in what they are doing. But to them, it's something great. You, as the landlord, the owner of the house, when you come, these things are disturbing you. You take your broom, you take you, you clean everything. That brings an end to all the work that this spider had done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who worship other things besides him or call on other things besides him, 
your example is like that of a, of a spider that thinks that she has constructed a very big and uh, a robust house, even though it is the weakest. So you are among the weakest and the most foolish of your people. That's what Allah is subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. You think that you are relying on something, but it is nothing. When you rely on charm, rely on voodoo, rely on juju, rely on netabalau and all this, you think that you are something with Allah, you are foolish and you are nothing. You are among the weakest. That is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, I mean, that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that put your trust in a name so that you can be strong and do not fear these people because they are working with shaitan and the shaitan can never do anything with it. anyone who truly believes in Allah and puts his trust in him. That's our trust being in Allah, not in anything that God, Allah, has created. Allah says that is Allah. This definition of Allah, that's what Allah does. If anyone asks who is Allah, quote this verse 31 for them. You want to know about Allah? This is Allah. Verse 31. Quote Surah 2, Al-Ikhlas, Kul huwa Allah ahad. Allah is summoned. Let them know who Allah is. If these are the only two things, one chapter, Surah Al-Ikhlas, and this verse, we can send to our Christian friends if you have them, or colleagues or relatives. Let them think about who Allah is. Perhaps that may lead them to, to Islam. We need to understand Allah. And the understanding Allah is the best thing that we as Muslims rejoice in. Because <coughs> those people, they have got a car confused a belief about ideology, confused ideology about who God is. Verse 33. Allah says, Thus is the word of your Lord justified against those who rebel, who disobey Allah, that they will not believe. They will not believe some people will not believe, and the word of Allah will be justified against them. That is, the word of punishment will be justified against them because all revelations have come to them. Allah has explained to them everything in details in different ways. Preachers have preached. The book is there for them to have learned the truth. But knowing the truth and ignoring it, knowing the truth and ignoring it, they will never be guided because they ignore the truth. There are many among non-Muslims who actually know the truth about Islam, but they have one reason or the other that prevents them from embracing Islam. Some of them because of their position in their family, their position in their religious uh, organization. Um, there are many reasons that stop, stop, that stop some of them from embracing Islam, but they know the truth. If they continue in that way, then the word of Allah, that is the word of punishment of Allah, will be justified against them because they know the truth and they deny it. Unlike those who may not have had any access to the truth, Allah knows how he's going to undo their case in a special way on the day of resurrection. Verse 34, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, قُلْ هَلْ مِنْ شُرَكَائِكُمْ مَنْ يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ قُلِ اللَّهُ يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ فَأَنَّا تُؤْفَكُونَ Say, is there any of your partners, that is, those idols, those beings to whom you attribute divinity, is there any one of them that originates the creation and then repeats it? Is there anyone who ever originates the creation that is he created something, something new, and would repeat it? Say, Allah is the one who originates the creation and then he repeats it. He will repeat it. Then, why are you turning away from the truth? This another thing that Allah Azza wa Jalla does. Is the one who originated the creation. No one can create, can claim that he has originated any creation. Allah, whatever we make, we only discover what Allah has already completed. We only uh, maneuver what Allah has already done in the universe. That is how why we are able to make different things. You see, we are creative, we are innovative. All our creation, innovation, 
we are basing it on what Allah has already completed in his work. We did not discover it before. Now we discovered them. Then we use our discovery to do what? To discover more, more things. That is all we do. But that anyone creates anything, it is Allah who has completed the creation. There is no other one who does this. We have to declare the unity and the lordship and the godhood of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah says, it is Allah who unites the creation from Ma'idu and is going to repeat it. That is very important. Allah is going to repeat the creation. What does that mean? When we die, Allah is going to bring us back to life. That one is certain. He's going to repeat this creation. He has told us about this. Many parts of the Quran that we have firm belief that where we are is only a temporary arrangement. We are only meant to prepare for where we are going to spend our eternity here. We are like travelers who have not gotten to their destination. We, whenever we take a dead person to their destination, it is actually the dead person that is showing us our destination. Yeah, it's the dead ones that are showing us our destination whenever we take them to their uh, so-called destination. Allah says is the one who, is, who originates the creation and is the one who is going to repeat it. He has the power to do it, but we were nothing before. Then if we become nothing, Allah is coming to Allah can bring us to become something again that is a new creation that is in the day, on the day of resurrection. Why are you turned away from the truth? Don't turn away from the truth. This is the truth. Allah says in verse 35, Allah says, Is there anyone among your so called partners that guides to the truth? That is, those idols or saints or whatever that you attribute uh, divinity to. Is there anyone amongst them that guides to the truth? It is Allah who guides to the truth. All these things you worship besides Allah cannot guide you to the truth. It is only Allah who guides to the truth. See, it is Allah. It's, it's then he who guides to the truth, more worthy to be followed, or he who finds not guidance himself unless he is guided. Allah uses this to condemn the idol and the idol worship. Why? Would you worship idols? You carved them with your hands. You molded them. You uh, sculpted them. You built them. You drew them. Why would you now attribute uh, something to what is nothing? You are the one who made these things. Why would you now attribute divinity to them? You come, you make sacrifices to it. You uh, make uh, rituals to them. So it's something that is so strange how people would stoop so low to the worship of idols. But that is what Shaitan does sometimes. It makes evil fear seeming to you. He beautifies uh, heresy for you. And you think that you are doing something nice, something great, not even realizing that you are on the wrong. You are misguided. This is why we have to be very careful in our life. Because you may wonder, why would the Arabs in the past, <coughs> why would they worship idols? If you want to condemn Arabs, who did this in the past? But know that idol worship is still part of the world. So what happened to people's intellects? That they will be worshiping something they have, you know, created with their own hands. They have molded, they have manufactured it with their own hands. They still worship those things. You may wonder, that is what Shaitan does. And you must be on your guard too. You may, own, you may also be signing your ruin warrant with happiness. Yeah. With happiness, you will make all sacrifices and compromise for error, for misguidance, and you may not realize it. That is why 
one of the most important things to us in life is to be on the path of uh, right guidance. You see, in Surah al fatiha that we recite every day in our Salat, and without which Salat is not complete, we say, Hidina Surat al Mustaqim, O Allah, guide us as Surat al Mustaqim, the straight path. You know, Ilah is not there. It's not Hidina Ilah Surat al Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. Hidina Surat al Mustaqim. Because we are already on that street, we are already on the path. So for Allah to keep, to keep guiding us means to keep us firm on the right path, which is uh, Islam. Because it's possible for you to be on the path, but not on the straight path. You may be on the straight path, but you may be derailed from that path. You may be taken away from that path. Take for example, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, on the day of rising and day of resurrection, after other events, after people had passed the bridge and they come to meet him at the Haud, a cistern, a pool that Allah is going to give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This cistern, this pool of water, the water there is sweeter than honey, is whiter than the milk, and uh, anyone who drinks from it will never thirst. You never experience thirst in your life. Again, if you drink from this uh, system, from this, uh, uh, this well of water, and the number of cups there are the number of stars in the heaven. That is, they are as much as the stars in the, the heaven. The Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu is followers. That is the first place where we're going to meet the Messenger of Allah. And that is the first thing he's going to entertain us with. Yes, that's why their number. If you are looking at it from the perspective of this world, we have so limited things, limited sight, limited hearing, limited brain in this world. But on the day of our resurrection, this is going to be enhanced. Our high sight, our hearing, our brain, our body, our power, our everything is going to be enhanced. This is why Allah says, As him, wa abusul, yatu nana. They won't see better than the day they are coming to meet us. They won't hear better than the day they are going to meet us. That is, the best you could hear will be on the day when you meet Allah. And the best you are going to see is when you are going to meet Allah. Even among the, some creatures in this world, there are some of them who have better taste than us. They can smell better than us. They can see better than us. They can hear better than us, even though they are sorry, so minute uh, uh, creatures of, uh, of Allah. What am I saying? The Prophet Sallallahu said, we are going to meet, he's going to receive us at this house. And uh, unfortunately, the Muslims will be turned away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. will be driven away. The angels will be driven, driving them away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I will not be saying, no, 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 leave them. They are part of my Ummah. Because he will have recognized them with certain things that show that they are part of the Muslim Ummah. The angels will now be saying, oh, inna ka la ma ahdathu ba'dak. You, you don't know what they did after you. They changed your religion. They changed your religion after you. So there are many people who have changed Islam. They have changed Islam. They worship Islam with their desires. They have certain ideologies that are foreign to Islam, but they have been fostered on, uh, on Islam. So this is why there is a difference between Islam as it ought to be and Islam as it is. So Islam as it ought to be and Islam as it is. You see some, some outrageous things that some Muslims do, which is not part of the deen. So if some people believe certain things that, not, that cannot even be traced to the Quran, or to the authentic of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We should be very careful. Look at this prayer. Ihdina Surat Al-Mustaqim. It's a very powerful prayer. We need to pay attention to it whenever we decide it. Surat Al-Ladhin Al-Amt Alayhi. Guide us in the straight path, the path of those whom you are faithful. Guide them to the Alayhi Mu'adhalim. Not the path of those who have hand your wrath. Not those who have gone astray. Who are those who have hand Allah's wrath? Who are those who have gone astray? Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nadith reported by Imam Ahmad bin Ambal. The Prophet said, Inna lima guduba alayhim al-Yahud wa inna al-Dawaleen al-Nasara. Those who have hand Allah's wrath are the Jews. Wa inna al-Dawaleen, those who have uh, uh, gone astray are the Christians. SubhanAllah. That is the, uh, the, uh, the major example of those who have gone astray and those who have hand Allah's wrath. But not something, these people that the uh, the Prophet said, this verse is referring to that they have hand Allah's wrath 
Jews. Notice, do they, they claim to be the followers of Prophet Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? Even though they deny Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam, but they deny before him, they deny Jesus Christ as well. So they are maghdud alayhi, they are and Allah's wrath. These people still claim that they are the children of Allah, and they are the only inheritors of the heart, and it is Jews and others. To them, others are others, but they, they are really the, uh, the nation of Allah. They are the people of God. Others are like slaves to them. That is what they believe. And the Quran says they are the Ali, and they still claim, also today, especially Orthodox Jews, that they are still followers of Prophet Musa Ali, and what the Quran says about them. Look at the Christians today. Don't they follow Jesus? According to them, Jesus is their message. They can die for, me, for Jesus. Have you read about the Crusades? Read about the Crusades. Remember, you remember the atrocities that the Christians committed during this, those periods in the name of Jesus, killing people in the name of Jesus. They are the one who established something known as Holy War. Holy War. Holy War. Because the word Holy War does not appear anywhere in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Prophet. But to know is jihad, and jihad does not mean holy war. We are not discussing that today. So, in the name of Jesus, they have committed all sorts of atrocities. The hatred some Christians have on Muslims is because of Jesus, according to them. But are they followers of Jesus? Who actually, among you, the Muslims and the Christians, are the followers of Jesus? We are. We know Jesus better than they do. We know the right Jesus. We know the true Jesus. So, there's the claim that they follow. Look at the sacrifice they are making from their salaries, from their incomes, 10% to their church leaders. Look at them at night, not night vigil, or not vigil, vigils, and many other sacrifices they are making for this dollar and misguidance, subhanAllah. That is the extent to which Shaitan can beautify heresy for anyone. This is why you must be on your guard as well. Don't think that because you are a Muslim or a Muslim, then everything ends there. It doesn't. This is why the first instruction in the Quran is what? Iqra, Iqra, Iqra. Read, read, read. You must know what you are doing. You must know why you are doing what you are doing. Islam is a religion that wants us to also use our reason on the basis of the Quran, the revelations, and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu but you must use your reason as well. Don't be misguided. We won't have any evidence if someone misguides you, now claim on the day of resurrection, someone who has misguided me. Allah will say, didn't I tell you, Iqra? Was that not the first instruction in the Quran for you? So let's be on our guard. Allah says, فَمَلَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ why? How do you judge? It is Allah who guides to the truth, so you don't have any reason to follow those who cannot guide you to the truth. This it is true that Allah has sent down to us the Quran and also the guidance through the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't have any reason to follow to worship idols. For those who worship idols, they still worship idols today because Shaitan has beautified that error and misguidance for them. May Allah save us from the evil. Of shaitan. Verse 36. Allah says, Wama yatabiru aktharuhum illa dhanna inna dhanna la yuhuni min al haqqi shay'a inna Allah alimun bima yaf'aloon. Allah says, Wama yatabiru aktharuhum illa dhanna. Most of them follow nothing but conjecture. Conjecture. It says, But certainly, conjecture can be of no, no use against the truth. Conjecture cannot substitute the truth. Surely, Allah knows everything they do. Conjecture cannot substitute the truth. That is what Allah says here. Pay attention to this. We have dhan, we have haq. Two things I mentioned here in verse 36. We have dhan, we have al-haq. What is dhan? Something that is based on the, uh, assumption. Something that is based on assumption is not real. It's not factual, it's not uh, the facts. Then Allah says in the one the other one is al-haq, the truth, the fact. So many people now see what Allah says. Most of them follow dhan. Most people follow dhan, fiction, myth, something that is not real. 
corrupted belief, uh, corrupted belief, confused ideology. That is what most people will follow. Most, that's the majority. When it comes to following the truth, if you are not careful, you'll be misguided as well. There's one hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah in the man kind of those who, were the, who came before you got divided. The Jews divide, were divided into about 71 religious sects. The Christians were divided into about 72 religious sects. During the time of the Jews, it was only one that was on the, on the truth before the advent of Jesus Christ. Then, during, when Christians got divided, only one of them was on the truth before the Prophet وسلم, came. The Prophet now said, but this ummah of mine will be divided into 73 religious sects. 73 religious sects. Who do you have enough? All of which will go to hellfire. Illa wahida. Except only one. Except only one. 73 will be, will be divided into 73 sects. Only one will be saved. al firqatu najiyah Only one will be al firqatu and najiyah According to Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, that re religious revivalist that hailed from Saudi Arabia, <coughs> he said, this hadith should not be misunderstood. It doesn't mean that majority of Muslims will be heading to hellfire. No. It only means that there will be a lot of ways of misguidance. There will be ways of misguidance will be so numerous, be so many. That's what it means. And there may be some ways of misguidance that may not have more than a thousand people there, or less than a thousand or hundreds of people there. So there will be so many. It doesn't mean the majority of Muslims will go to hellfire. In fact, followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be the majority of people in Jannah. Followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be the majority of people in Jannah. But in this dunya, we must be on our guard. If you are not, not careful, we can have as, as many ideologies as the number of humans on earth. Yes, especially these days where people are so arrogant. They are so arrogant, they follow their desires. Everybody is now an authority. When it comes to religious matters, everybody is an authority now. You see a lot of people saying rubbish, saying all sorts of things, you know. They, 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 they are the authority, they give fatwa without uh, knowledge. They give fatwa without knowledge, without learning, without respect for scholarship. A lot of them are there. Now we are in the age of the social media, Allah Akbar. So we have a lot of groups being created on WhatsApp. And we have the group leader who may have assumed the position of, uh, of authority and Sheikh Islam hmm? and Qadi al Qudot judging and doing every all sort of things without anybody knowing. So we see a lot of uh, brainwash today through the social media, through the Facebook, and so on and so forth. Wallahu Musta'an. The Prophet وسلم, said, We are going to lead the sect, we are going to be divided into 73 sects. Mind you, as well, when the Prophet mentions sect, he's not saying Jama'a, the organization is sect, Furqa. So, Firqa, before you can call a particular group a Firqa, they must have uh, had certain principles with which <coughs> they distinguish themselves from other Muslims. So we have some religious fundamentals that are peculiar to them, and uh, on the basis of which they relate with others. Anyone who does not follow them in those ideologies or principles, they don't see them as Muslims, and they may even not consider, they may not consider them as Muslims. They may not marry to them, they may not marry from, uh, from them. They may not even, uh, uh, you know, relate with them in any way when it comes to religious matter. They may not pray behind them. We know some sects who do this, who treat other Muslims as if they are not, uh, they are not Muslims. We have to be on our guard. We have to be very careful. So a sex may have a name. They have a name, they may have a name, they may have a particular ideology which makes them different from other Muslims. They may condemn other Muslims. So don't get it wrong. When the hadith is quoted sometimes, the people will believe that, no, there should not be any jama'ah. There should not be any jama'ah. You must not have any group. You must not form any group in order to promote Islam. It's not possible for you to promote Islam in a meaningful way if you don't form groups. Like uh, we have uh, in Nigeria here, we have MSS for the uh, Muslim students. We have uh, MCAN for Muslim uh, 
or who, are, who are serving, serving core, core members to this kind of organizations. So we have many or two, we have uh, uh, Nasfat, we have Korib, Tabomono, Ansaruddin, Ansaru Islam, Taawuno. There are many, or many others. I'm not saying that all of these sects, I mean, they are not sects. These, these ones are not sects because what they are doing, they are doing it for the rights of the Muslims. They don't discriminate. They relate peacefully with other Muslims. They only form a group so that they'll be able to use their uh, the strength, that numerical strength to promote uh, Islam. It doesn't mean that in some of them, there may be certain things they do which may not be very correct in accordance with the Sunnah or the Prophet Yes, there are many of them who are doing certain things that say may not be very correct when it comes to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So internationally, we have uh, 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 movements like uh, the Tablighi, we have Ikhwan al-Muslimun, we have uh, Jamaatu al-Islamiyah. There are many of them. So, and some of them, they are interest group. Some of them pay attention to welfare of the Muslims or to spread knowledge. And uh, we have um, uh, a Muslim World League. So it's an Islamic, Islamic Development Bank. So, and all these people must come together. But when we come together, we should not have any ideology or principles that are different from what is extreme, uh, uh, enshrined in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu And we should not discriminate against other uh, Muslims. And uh, we should not constrain the truth to our own group. And we should never say that these people, uh, they must not marry from us or uh, whoever belongs to us must marry. You must marry from our association. You must not marry from uh, outside. If you are an outsider, you must join before you marry from us, or you give oath of allegiance to your, uh, to your leader. You must not, I didn't mention TMC, it's part of uh, what we have as local, local movement in Nigeria. And also I didn't mention Izala, it's part of what you have in, uh, in Nigeria. So when you have, you give oath of allegiance to your leader as well, that whatever the leader sees, that's what you must do. Even if you want to contract marriage, once your leader has uh, given his consent, even though your parents, do not consent to it, you can go ahead with that marriage, that is heresy, then that group is becoming a kind of, uh, kind of sex. So you must be careful about this. And this group must not be taking up any arm. There must not be weapon. This group is uh, you know, amassing weapon for anything. You must not do that. When it comes to using weapon to fight anything in the society or to find, it must be good government who must do that. Any group that is... Uh, uh, piling up weapons for any reason, that group is a sex. You must be careful of, uh, of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us aright. So any group formed must be on the basis of Tawheed, oneness of Allah, must be on the basis of Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on the basis of the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet. There is no way we can practice Islam effectively today without coming together as a uh, as group. But we don't want this proliferation of many groups and uh, organizations as we're having as a lot of groups all around. People are doing it just like the Christians are forming churches all here and there. Yeah? <laughs> they are mushrooming everywhere. They, are not, they don't have good intention. madrasa, The next thing, he starts as a lot of group in his neighborhood. With knowledge, without knowledge, many of them, yes, without knowledge. Most of the leaders of the Salatu groups don't have knowledge. They don't teach you about religion. They only tell you, you don't do collective du'a. You do some, uh, you know, nafila together, Salatu du'a together, all sorts of things. You come with a particular clothes, you have your uniform, you must come with white. Uh, when you are coming, you see some of them come with uh, eggs. When you are coming, you are coming with a particular object, they are going to pray over it for you. Uh, the, the day of our fest, they have been using all sorts of things that Christians have been using. And Muslims who are doing it, the eve of uh, January 1st, the, uh, the eve of this, special Tahajjud night, all this, this name, 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 just like the Christians, because of ignorance. They don't have intention of guiding people. They only want to amass the crowd and uh, to make money out of them. Let us fear Allah. Let us fear Allah. Let us fear Allah. We are going back to him. We are going back to him and we are going to stand before him for accountability. Allah says, be careful. Always try to distinguish al-haq from avon because most people follow avon. They follow avon. 
conjecture, not the truth. Always look for the truth. Use your brain. When you are listening to any lecture, you are reading anything, you are reading something on the internet, because some people now, everything about them, in the, also, that's why you see, they go to the internet, what does it, to get a fatwa, to get it, the word fatwa that may be given by a body that, uh, you know, may not understand your peculiarities, you know, it may not go well with uh, what are obtained in your society or in your community sometimes. So that is why we need to refer to local scholars and solve some issues as well as we compare fatwa from different uh, councils. Because if you know, you are, there are many organizations, there are many groups today where fatwa can be issued, can compare them and use your own reason as well to be guided. But before you use any reason or logic in anything, always ask Allah for guidance and make sure that your intention is pure and you are open-minded and you follow the guidance. You must have evidence for anything you want to do or say as far as the Quran is concerned. And if it is hadith, make sure that the hadith being used for you is a authentic hadith. May Allah Azza wa Jalla keep us on the path of guidance. May Allah never misguide us. Idina surat al-mustaqim, surat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim, ghayri al-magdubi alayhim, wa al-dhalin. This is where we are going to stop today, inshallah. May Allah this, make this beneficial to me and to you. May Allah keep us firm on surat al-mustaqim. May Allah keep us firm on the kitab and sunnah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. So we can send in our questions, inshallah. Are there Jews who are still living just like uh, the Christians? Yes, of course, we have Jews who are still living. As we have Christians, we have Jews as well. They are not common in, the, in Nigeria as we have Christians all over. So the population, you cannot, one can hardly embrace Judaism. You must, in most cases, you will be born as a Jew before you can claim to be a Jew. So you can't, for them, it's a religion that is uh, exclusively for them, so they, must be born a Jew, so, but for you to embrace Judaism is not uh, uh, that common or that, uh, that easy, because definitely you will be discriminated uh, against, unlike uh, Islam. You know, Islam doesn't have anything to do with a tribe. So Judaism is a kind of tribalism, so, which is uh, a kind of aberration, but that is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent any uh, prophet with. Prophet Musa was a Muslim. Those who followed him were Muslims, yeah, according to the, uh, the Quran. So, so we have Jews as we have the Christians today. Islamic injunction on forex trading. So my advice on this is to avoid it because of uh, the confusion in, uh, in it. So I've often kept from answering any question when it comes to forex uh, trading. But if it is dealing in foreign currencies, there is nothing bad in that, like a borrow the change a business if you want to change one currency or another currency, that is permissible. You want to change Naira for dollar and it starts to be hand to hand. And then for Anin Bawa, hand to hand. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, فَإِذَا اخْتَلَفَتْ هَذِهِ الْأَجْنَاسِ فَبِيعُوا كَيْفَ شِئْتُمْ إِذَا كَانَ يَدًا بِيَدٍ When you are exchanging different currencies, you can sell and buy as you like. That is, on the basis of your uh, consent, and also on the basis of the market force. As long as this, the kind of yadam at the same spot, this is my dollar, physical dollar, and this is Naira, for example. So, but the one that is often done on the, uh, the screen, the internet, there are a lot of uh, issues about that. I would advise that is, uh, we abstain from it unless we get a fatwa from a respected and trusted body who better understands the concept of the one we are referring to and they give us a, for, uh, a go ahead, then that will be between us and whoever gives us the, the fatwa, the Allah get us uh, a right. I joined the second record of Juma prayers and I wanted to repay the two records afterwards. Do I recite aloud or quietly? If you have joined the Juma's prayer, the second raka, before the Imam raised, earth, uh, raised up his head from uh, Rukur, then 
you have met the raka. You have met the raka. So that raka you have met, if you can meet the imam at Ruku, you have caught the raka. So when the imam finishes, all you have to do is to add one more to it. But if the imam has raised up his head from the Ruku in the second raka, it means you have lost Juma completely. You have to observe four rakats. Uh, and if you are observing uh, it as Jumwa, then you read it aloud as the Imam read. If you are observing it as Zul, as the case may be, therefore, then it has to be a silent a prayer. Last week, questions please. Is one's wife's niece, Muharram, the niece of your wife, that is the sister of your wife, the uh, her own daughter? So is it your Muharram? It's not your Muharram. Now, how many rakats is one expected to observe after Jumu'at prayer? We can observe two, and uh, we can observe uh, four. We can observe two, and we can observe four. The, according to Ibn Umar, when the Prophet Sallallahu finished his prayer, and he, he went home, in his house, he used to observe two rakats. And uh, if at the mosque, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Man arada minkum, and you solli abada al-Jumu'ah, fal you solli abada al-Arba'ah. Anyone who wishes to offer salat after Jumu'ah, then he should offer four rakats. So this is why scholars said, one has the option to choose to observe four or, or two. Allahu A'lam. For those who were unable to do aqiqah, I mean killed the ram. After they prescribe this, is it compulsory for them whenever they could afford it? Yes, it's highly advisable that they do it whenever they have the ability to do it. If I have to do it on the fourth, seventh day, can't do it then, and the second, fourteenth day, uh, seventh day, which is fourteenth day or twenty-first day. After that, you can do it at any time that is uh, possible for you, and we should not leave it. Please describe and demonstrate Ba'adi and Qabli corrections. For mistakes in <coughs> in salat, so I think it's not a matter that we can just resolve in that uh, 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 simply like that. But I will give a few examples. For probably, if for example you forget to say what you are supposed to say at rukul and what you are supposed or what you are supposed to say in your sujood, so you can continue with your prayer. When you remember, before you make the slim. When you make a Teslim, do two prostrations. When you have completed your prayer, you are only left with Teslim, do two prostrations as remedy for that mistakes you have made. That is what you have, uh, you have not said in your Ruku or Sujud. Or what you are supposed to recite a Surah after Fatiha, you don't forget it, so you can do Sujud or Kobli for, for uh, that kind of things. Or your first sitting in Salat, you forgot after two Raka and Zul, for example, you go for the Raka, then you may continue with your prayer if you have got up when you are before you finish your prayer after before the slim you now do two prostrations that suffices for that but if for example you forget to recite Surah al fatiha you forget to uh do your ruku or you don't you didn't raise up your head after ruku you forget one of the two prostrations or you forget uh, something something like that like that for this in that case you have to bring one maraka to remedy that mistake. You forget to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, that raka in which you have forgotten it is gone. You now bring one complete raka. After that, you uh, now do what? When you make your teslim, you now do two prostrations again to remedy the forgetfulness. That is Yudu Ba'adi. The first one is Yudu Qabli, Qabla Salam. Then the, this one is Ba'adi. The same thing. When you want to offer three raka, you don't do four, you do badi. So this is uh, just a few examples about uh, that. Uh, what's the ruling of Muslims engaging in POS business? Customer were debited from debit card with charges and cash given out. So in this case, we are rendering a, a surface. So it's not foreign exchange, but we are rendering a, a, rendering a surface. And uh, it's not that we are changing particular currency for the same oh, because that one is haram if for example you have naira you want to change this to new notes and uh, 
instead of 1,000 Naira, a person now gives to Naira and 50 Naira new notes. You know, it's the same, you know, it's the same Naira it is haram. We must not uh, do that. But using the POS, the POS business is to facilitate things for, for people. There is no harm. In that is like the bank charges too, because you make any withdrawal or you, uh, you make a transfer, you are charged on, because of the services they are rendering. No problem, inshallah. But the, if you are invited, please let's ask this question on uh, Sunday when we are going to discuss the issue of, uh, of uh, sacred duties in Islam for that. What about a father who couldn't afford two rams for his new male child? What should he do? He should do one now. Whenever he is able to do the remaining one, he should do it. Uh, inshallah, this is where we are able, we are, going to, we are going to stop today. So something comes to mind again. If someone who asked about the needs of your wife, if that person is your mahram uh, or, or not. You know, a mahram is someone that you cannot uh, marry. And the Prophet in one hadith said, you should not marry the sister uh, of, a, of your wife because it will cause problems. When the Quran says that, then you should not marry two sisters at a time. The same the Quran says that. And you should not marry the, um, uh, the aunt of your, of your wife. The same thing, you should not, yes, you should not marry the aunt, whether the maternal aunt or your maternal or paternal aunt. You should not marry with your, of your, of your wife because it will lead to a breakdown of the, of the family. But your sister, your wife, a sister, the daughter of that sister, of that sister of your wife, that's what the question is uh, asking about, whether that person is a mahram for you or not. There are many rulings that uh, go with a mahram. Please, let's leave it also. We talk more about it on, on Sunday when we talk about respect for privacy and the issue of a visitation as part of our civic duties. Inshallah, let's meet on Sunday to discuss more about the issue of mahram. May Allah uh, uh, be with us. May Allah forgive us our shortcomings. May Allah bless us and bless our families. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati asana tan wa kina agab al-na'u. Subhanaka Allahumma rabbana bihamdik. Ashaba la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. إن الإنسان ليطغى أن رآه استغنى إن إلى ربه